So let's talk about me a little bit, right? So that's my favorite part of the session, let's talk about me. So I'm Oak Brainred, I'm Hugo's evil twin. Uh, it's weird that our parents gave us different last names, but whatever. Uh, I work for a company called Enterprise uh, Virtual Information Limited, and uh, it's this is a picture of our headquarters here. And uh, normally, even before COVID, we didn't allow people to work from home, uh, but we did offer a free pop, and once in a week we had frozen yogurt, so that's cool. Uh, I specialize in helping organizations migrate to Office 365 in the most costly and inefficient way possible. I'm especially good at ruining migrations from SharePoint on-premise to Office 365 and SharePoint Online. And this is the experience I'm going to be using today to present. Thank you. So I'm actually the inventor, the proud inventor of those pop-up ads that you see all the time on websites. And I'm also the inventor of those auto playable audio uh, that you see on websites. I'm particularly proud of that. But probably my favorite invention is you know when you go on a website and you have to register and then they enter you they ask you to enter your email address once um, that way if you know if someone gives you a fake email address you're fooling them by asking them to enter their email address a second time that was my invention and i'm very proud of that so today we'll talk about well first of all why would you want to fail right um, as an evil consultant, and if you're like me, there's lots of good reasons why you would want to fail. For example, job protection, right? Instead of taking three months to do something, uh, I can lock myself in a two-year contract to do the exact same thing. And you know, if I did a particularly good job at failing, I can I can come back and do it again because it failed. So I now I'm hired to to stay and do longer. Um, according to the Standish Group. Um, they produce a report called the Chaos Report. It's one of my favorite reports, right? Every year they produce this report and they analyze software project failures and success. And they look at what are the root causes and things like that. They say that 71% of IT projects don't deliver on time and on budget. That's really impressive. But if you look at the amount of money that is spent or wasted, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, um, according to PwC, that translates to $27 trillion between 2016 and 2020. So where does that my money go to? Well, you know, migration projects are IT projects, so part of it goes into my pocket. And you could fail too if you wanted. But what do I mean by failing? And by the way, I don't know if you know what this picture is, but this is a picture that was taken when Steve Ballmer gave a keynote presentation at a Microsoft event. And if you look really carefully, I don't know if I can show you this, right here. It was awesome. So um, what do we mean by failing? Well, we're talking about cost overruns and delays, right? Failing means taking longer and costing more than it should to do the actual migration. So the guy in this picture is actually an intern who worked with me when we first started the migration for a client. That's what he looks like now. The other thing about failing is poor user adoption, right? So, you know, trying to do everything that you can in your power to, you know, so that your your users don't want to use your platform. In this case, it would be Office 365 or Microsoft 365. You also, one of my favorite ways of failing is losing data, right? So, and I'm not talking about, oops, I deleted some some stuff, like let's go to the recycling bin. I'm talking about losing stuff forever. And it's possible. You could do that, do that too. So how do we fail? And if there's any questions, by the way, I'm uh, feel free to ask the questions. I won't answer them, but feel free to ask them in the chat window. So how do we fail? Well, the first thing that you should do, and this is probably if you walk away with one thing uh, only, is when you do an IT uh, a migration project, make sure that it's an IT only project. All right. So, because if you think about it, you know, if you start making it involving other people and stuff like that, um, you know, you've got different objectives, right? You as an IT person, you want smooth operations. You you don't want to change a running system. But business 
they're all like, I want the freedom and the ability to experiment and to to learn and to drive change and, and to be, you know, to adapt to changes. So that's a huge conflict right there, right? Um, you know, deploying a new office version and a new uh, infrastructure versus empowering everyone to streamline and transform their business. Um, so we're barely scratching the surface here, right? If we're talking about things like, you know, talking about features versus being user centric, right? Those are all uh, different things that, that people want and you don't want that. That's just too much trouble. So just make sure that if you can do only one thing, make sure it's an IT only project, don't involve anybody else outside of your migration and don't embrace the change mindset, right? Your job is to protect yourself really and protect your job security. So with that in mind, don't involve your users, right? Probably the number one rule to make sure you fail um, or the number two rule is, is that if you talk to your users, they'll whine, right? They'll talk about the things they don't like about the current system and they might actually tell you what they want. So don't talk to your users, whatever you do, avoid them. Don't even let them know where, where you work. Um, you know, again, <laughs> You know, your users often are, are used to uh, getting to talk to, to IT maybe once every three years. And the minute you talk to them and you say, hey, you know, good news, we're going to be migrating stuff for you. They have like three years worth of pent up aggression towards you that, you know, and, and, and things that haven't worked and they want to talk to you and they're going to they're going to try to include every single one of those things when they talk to you. And they're not going to be able to prioritize. They're going to want every single feature known to men. So the best thing you can do is don't even inform your users because guess what? You know better, right? If you talk to your users, again, they'll just whine. It's better to avoid that. Um, you know, they'll if you if you start talking to them, they'll think that you want them to be happy. They'll they'll they won't understand what you're trying to do, right? They might explain uh, to you what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's boring, right? I don't, I don't even want to know what I do on a daily basis. Imagine listening to people telling me what they do on a daily basis. Um, and then you would probably start understanding how they would benefit from using SharePoint Online and Microsoft 365. Um, and what's even worse is that uh, it's been proven that when you ask people for their advice, they're invested in seeing you succeed. So if you ask for their advice, they might actually start understanding um, that you're willing to help them and they might be willing to, to meet you halfway. And you don't want that, right? You want to be able to, to be the one that has all the cards, that makes all the decisions. Thank you, I see people are writing notes. That's great. Uh, again, I'm looking for questions if you have questions. So with that in mind, don't communicate to your users. Whatever you do, right, keep them in the dark. Um, because, yeah, you know, well, you want to know that you're moving on, you're planning on moving their applications uh, and their files, but don't give them any more information about how, like about things like timing or how you're going to do that or why you're doing that. Um, and the, the cool thing about that is if you let them know that you're going to be doing this, but you don't communicate with them, they're going to make up their own stories about what's going to happen and how about how horrible it's going to be. And they're instantly, like in their minds, they're going to make up stories that are even worse than anything you could ever come up with. And they'll instantly start fighting against any migration that you have because they're just afraid of how you're going to change their life and how they're going to have to change how they work. And remember, you're the expert. They're not the expert, so they don't understand, you know, how you might be improving their lives. So they're coming up with all sorts of crazy stories, and that's good. Let them stew. Let them let them freak out about the stories and come up with all sorts of crazy scenarios. And don't explain to them why it'll be more convenient to use the cloud, right? Or how the information is going to potentially be going to be more secure. Um, because if you if you do that, I mean, an example of this, I see this all the time, is users that are saying, well, okay, so we had to work, we had to work from home because of COVID, uh, but we don't have access to any of the systems. And so we have to VPN in for everything. And the VPN is slow and it's, you know, it blocks all sorts of stuff. 
Um, so you could potentially go and explain to them, hey, you know, if we move to the cloud, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be able to access your information from anywhere, and it's going to be super awesome. Uh, but again, you don't want to do that because then they might start enjoying the idea that you're going to be migrating, and that's not good. Remember that users love surprises. If you work in IT, it's probably easy for you to adapt to new versions of software, right? When a new version of uh, Edge uh, adds to, installs to your computer or a new version of Office installs to your computer and the icons move or there's new features, for you, it's probably super easy to adapt to that, right? Or saving your files to a new place. When you go file save as, all of a sudden it's prompting you to save to your OneDrive for business instead of saving to your desktop. For you, it's super easy for uh, to understand what's happening and to adapt to that. But for most non-IT people who you know, don't want to have anything to do with IT or computer, uh, it can be a huge thing, right? So imagine coming in on Monday morning and you, you know we've migrated all the stuff uh, over, we've changed everything for you and we've upgraded your version of Office and everything. And then those users come in on Monday morning and they have you know, this big report to produce and the fiscal year end to do and, and things like that. And you've changed all their stuff, right? The users love surprises. So that's one great way to fail is to ensure that you're making users experience a horrible experience. One thing that I would tell you, don't waste your time on content audit. Now, don't get me wrong. If you want to bill people for a content audit, that's a great way to not deliver anything uh, and, uh, and, and be able to bill for it. But uh, every expert out there will tell you that one of the key you know, things to do when you do a migration is to do an inventory of your content before you plan to migrate anything. <laughs> what a waste of time. It's, they expect you to identify all the content you have um, so that you'll have to migrate it so you can plan your migration and find, find the potential issues, right? I mean, that's where the fun is, is when you start the migration and you're able to actually, um, you know, see all the surprises. Oops, there's a new, you know, I didn't realize we had these types of files and these types of files are no longer supported in, in Microsoft 365. Uh, or, you know, hey, the version of this, the client that's used for this um, doesn't exist anymore, and we're not going to be able to edit these files ever again. Those are fun surprises, because again, you can always take a project that's supposed to take this long, and you're able to charge uh, a lot longer for it. And speaking of, you know, bad things, status quo is actually a good thing. That's actually funny. I have that exact same outfit. Um, so if you're working from a SharePoint on-premise to a SharePoint online, uh, you probably have files from a, a few years ago, right? In some cases, you could have files from like 20 years ago. And experts will tell you that it's you shouldn't migrate everything, uh, that you can't, you, you should identify the content that has no business being migrated because of retention rules and privacy rules and everything. Uh, because, you know, again, the experts, they say that uh, most business evolve to meet uh, changing business needs of the organization and their document structure should should evolve the same way. I just lost my clicker. Um, so I say you should move everything exactly as is, right? Including, it doesn't matter if there's duplicates of files and if there's folder structures that are like 17 folders deep. It doesn't matter. You should migrate it as is. Again, don't listen to the experts that tell you that you should analyze everything and start planning. Um, that's just that's just not the right thing to do. Now, if you're lucky, uh, you can even get another engagement to go through a whole cleanup process. So you're actually billing twice for the same project. This is wonderful, right? Uh, you, you get paid to do more. And probably one of my favorite things about this is that if you're lucky, when you migrate your files over to uh, Office 365, you might actually have file paths that are longer than what's supported by Office 365 because you have you have URLs uh, that are sites within sites within sites within sites, and then libraries, you know, and then folders and subfolders and subfolders, and then people will create file names that are that have like, you know, um, 
March 31st, 2019, version one, final, final, dot, XLX, S, whatever, doc or docx or PPT. Uh, that's great because it makes super long, long file names that you might be able to upload them to uh, to Microsoft 365 because Microsoft 365 now doesn't let you upload documents if the path is going to be too long. And the path length is about 400 and something characters. I can't remember. But the great thing is that even though the files are uploaded, sometimes when you try to download the files, uh, you can actually, uh, the clients on your Windows desktop might not be able to deal with a file path that is longer than 255 characters. So that's great because now you're uploaded doc uploading documents. Users can see the documents, but when they try to do anything with those documents, they open the document and it says, oops, sorry, I can't open this document. And then guess what? The users freak out because they think that their documents are broken and they're destroyed and they start escalating and freaking out. Uh, so this is just a pleasant surprise when you have extra uh, long file names. Again, you know, you could, listen to the experts and say, well, I'm going to look at all the, the file path structures and I'm going to try to uh, to narrow that down a little bit so that we don't have super long file paths. Or you could uh, you could do what I do and just embrace the long file names and the long paths uh, because again, it'll keep you busy. Uh, so we have a question here by Kathleen. Uh, how would you improve on user buy for migration, especially from on-prem to online? and and paths uh so I, I and kathleen i don't think you can unmute so i'll try to interpret your question here um so i'm not an expert at helping people buy in but um you know some of the things that some experts uh would would talk about again is is identifying uh the value that's in it for them right so experts always say ask yourself as the as the users what's in it for me Right and uh, and asking um, what's going to be the change in my experience, right? Because we've I've seen uh, systems that have been changed where we're completely changing the systems and the experience, uh, and users actually ended up falling in love with the new experience, especially when you start talking about using things like Teams and things like that, right? Uh, or the new look and feel of SharePoint. And as Chris Kent pointed out, right, the ability to use things like uh, the lookbook to make sites that look great. Um, again, that's if you want to be successful. I'm only talking about what's not successful. And we'll talk about some of the some of the best practices to avoid uh, for migration a bit a bit shortly. I hope that answers your question, Kathleen. Or not. Um, the other thing to look at is gap analysis, right? So gap analysis, shmanel, uh, whatever. Gap analysis is a waste of time. If you're migrating content and applications from older versions of SharePoint, there can be a few things that won't work anymore, right? In SharePoint Online. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, things that happened uh, on November 1st was these workflows that stopped working, right? This is a pot of gold for me as, a, as an evil consultant because I get to go in and even though I knew that these workflows were going to be expiring on November 1st, uh, last thing I did was to inform my users that um, it, they were going to stop working. So now I'm willing and able to charge, you know, time and a half, double time, and ask people uh, to go in and, or for people to ask me to go in and fix their workflows. So look at, um, you know, when normally what you would do is you would do a gap analysis. You would say, huh, let me look at what we have here today. Right? Do we have access databases? We have Delve blogs. We have sandbox web parts, and then look at what's out there at the other end. And uh, you know that's your gap. And normally you would analyze that, and you would say, okay, so um, we're missing this feature. We're missing this feature. We're not going to have this anymore. So let's start creating a plan around these things. Right? Um, so for example, if you have uh, InfoPath forms out there. And you're trying to do a migration. You you can migrate your InfoPath forms to uh, SharePoint Online. It'll work. It it'll stop working in about 2026. Uh, but you know if you're if you play your cards right, you might either not be there anymore, and then it's their problem, or you might get them to bring you back and to uh, to charge 
to replace these forms. Uh, but the other approach, if you wanted to be successful, is you could say, uh, okay, well, let's look at things like uh, Power Apps, right? Let's look at Power Automate to replace some of these workflows. Or let's use uh, SharePoint lists. I hear that there's uh, lots of uh, awesome people that know how to do SharePoint lists. That's what I heard. So anyways, skip your uh, your, gap, your gap analysis. Again, it's you can still tell people you're doing it and then say you didn't find anything. Um, but the whole idea here is that people expect you to be able to come up with estimates. And I'm here to tell you now that estimates are for losers, right? So if you have your content audit and you cleaned up your content and you plan the things that you've identified during your gap analysis, you'd probably be able to get a good estimate of how long it would take to migrate everything. You might even be able to do a plan, right? Where you're able to, to decide when you're going to communicate with your users uh, and when's going to be an, a, a, a good time to migrate them. Because again, remember the accounting department, they have like the, the, the quarter end that they have to prepare, the fiscal year end that they have to prepare. Um, you know, so if you were planning and you were doing estimates, you would be able to talk to them and try to figure out, okay, well, let's do this where we have the least impact possible. But of course, if you're an evil, evil consultant like me, uh, you would try to coordinate that so that you're uh, giving them uh, the most trouble possible. Uh, again, if you have a plan, um, you know, people would even know when to expect their stuff to be migrated. And they might actually even hold you accountable for their migration. So whatever you do, don't do uh, don't do estimates. If they want timelines, tell them whatever they want to hear, uh, so they can leave you alone, right? Tell them two weeks. That's the standard uh, answer, two weeks, and then come up with something like, "Oh, I didn't realize that you had file paths that were too long, uh, so that's going to be another two weeks, right?" And honestly, once you've started the migration, they can't stop you, can they? I'm just looking for questions here. Yes. Uh, Kathleen, Kathleen, you're my new favorite expert uh, evil consultant. Uh, Kathleen is saying, uh, keep things behind the scenes until you're ready. That's right. And uh, speaking of keeping things behind the scenes and not doing analysis, don't waste your time with migration tools, right? Migration tools, uh, there's lots of amazing migration tools there. There are some that are available for free, like the Microsoft, uh, the SharePoint migration uh, tools. Uh, it's actually quite good. And I don't know when the last time you used the SharePoint migration tools, uh, but it's actually been improving, right? And the versions that they support, they're constantly adding more and more versions to support, as well as dealing with things like, uh, you know, changing the types of uh, pages to modern pages and things like that. And there's also some free tools available uh, in the, the patterns and practices team that allows you to modernize your sites and your pages, and that's available to you as well. But again, if you use those tools, then you know it's all stuff that's happening pretty much automatically and for free, and that's not good. Now, there's other tools that are, uh, I would say, even better that you you have to pay for. Uh, tools like uh, I think Kathleen is saying she uses ShareGate, so ShareGate is a great example of that. But here's the thing, right? When you're when you're paying one of the migration tools uh, for a migration tool, your client is really giving money that they should be giving to you. So don't use migration tools. Um, again, they would make they would make you they would do your job for you and it makes you look bad. And you know the other thing too is these migration tools, they can analyze your content, they can give you all sorts of reports that will tell you what will break and what will migrate successfully. And they might even give you estimates in terms of how to do your delta migrations and things like that. So it's much better. My approach is copy everything from scratch, right, by hand, and then make sure that you mess up the author and things like that, uh, because that's the, the greatest way. Now people are confused about which documents uh, are new and things like that. And and the picture that you see here behind me um, or in front of me, whatever that picture is uh, on the slide is is actually one of the first migration plans that they found in uh, for a SharePoint migration in one of the caves. And it was done by hand. And I, I hear they're almost done with that migration. 
so that's that's the idea, right? Imagine the guy that the, the guy or girl who gets to do this migration gets to bill for a migration by hand. Um, now again, keep in mind that you know the other thing that you get to do with with migrating things by hand is because you're messing up like the date modified and the date created and the things like that. There's there's going to be all this information that's bubble up at the, that's going to bubble up at the start of the of the the site that users have forgotten about for years and years and years because they have this old content and now it shows up as as new content. And well, the other good good thing too is you can actually use uh, custom PowerShell scripts every single time. Uh, Sherman, I like your I like your initiative. Yes, you can actually. Uh, that's great. You can you can charge your client to write a custom migration script every single time, and that works too. Now, uh, in terms of creating uh, custom PowerShell migration scripts, that's something that we should talk about because if you know some experts will say that if you do a migration and you're you're writing a custom migration script, uh, you know one of the cool things that you can do is you can actually do it so that your migrations are consistently done every single time. Right. I know some people have used uh, ShareGate exposes some PowerShell scripts, so they've used the PMPJS, uh, not the PMPJS, the PMP PowerShell. They've used the the Office 365 PowerShell and the ShareGate PowerShell to automate everything. And again, if you're trying to succeed, that would be a great thing because it's consistent. You can test it as many times as you want, and you're not introducing any variables. But again, our goal here is to fail. So you want to introduce as many variables as possible every single time you do a migration, because then you know if you're actually charging your clients to do a test migration and a production migration, you get to charge double. And if you introduce new variables at every time, that's great. All right, the other thing that we have to uh, consider here is use the Big Bang approach. So every lame expert out there will tell you that you should plan your migration to be iterative. And by that, they mean uh, take little bites and then deliver that and learn from that and then improve, right? Increase the scope of what you're trying to do and improve. Um, or start talking to a different audience every time, right? Start with this business unit and this other business unit and keep going. Oh, I see someone sharing their screen here. Hi, Colleen. Um, so don't do everything at once. Just take small chunks and migrate it. That's what experts tell you. Uh, and then they want you to test every migration and do all that stuff. But what I say is migrate everything all at once, right? Take down all the servers, all the network, everything for a long time, uh, depending on how much stuff there is to migrate, and then move everything all at once. Because guess what? If everything fails, you get paid to redo it all over again. Right? This is great. You're not learning from your mistakes because you're redoing it every time. Um, and again, who's going going to argue with you? I skipped the migration. I like I like the way you think, Chris. All right. So let's talk about some uh, concrete things here too. All right. So the first thing. When you when you start looking at how you're going to approach it, I, I almost said when you plan your migration, you don't plan your migration, you just wing it, right? But um, so delay the hardest tasks until the end. I just I just realized here that I forgot to insert my background slide. Uh, again, that was me delaying stuff. So you know a lot of experts will say when you look at a migration, look at the most technically risky things first and look at the most uh, important from a business perspective and these are the things that you should migrate first uh, again because if everything goes wrong you you know a little site that was like I don't know the Christmas party from five years ago and it has a bunch of pictures that nobody has looked at in over you know four years um, it's not really highly important. It's certainly not, you know, it's it's important to migrate it. I understand, and people are emotional about it. But uh, if you if you prioritize by putting the hardest task first, and the the most technically risky task first, and the most business important first, and everything goes wrong, 
all the good stuff is going to migrate it and and people don't really care about these little things that fell through the cracks uh, but if you if you defer the hardest task until the end the great thing about that is nobody can hold you accountable to have a, a good estimate because you're like yeah yeah good news we migrated the first two weeks we migrated the uh, christmas uh christmas party uh site now i know you want your hr site and your finance site to be up and running but the christmas vacation site has been migrated and now we need to take a break right and oh by the way we just realized we're two weeks before we're supposed to go live and this site that we just looked at it's not looking good there's lots of scary stuff that we didn't realize that it was it was going to be uh this hard so we're going to be six months behind i'm sorry All right and if hugo was here he would say something lame like Short of a rip in the fabric, fabric of time, this should never happen. You know, we shouldn't go, we're two weeks behind, we're, or we're two weeks you know, away from going live, and then oops, we're six months behind. He says that should never happen. Uh, but from my perspective, that's really the holy grail of what you should be aiming for. Uh, so whatever you do, delay the hardest tasks until the end. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're doing good. Make sure you password protect the content and leave without giving anyone the password. Wow, we should there should be some awards uh, for the most evil things said in this in this meeting. I really love it. Uh, you guys are inspiring me. Uh, you folks, I'm sorry. All right, uh, don't schedule maintenance windows. All right. So again, there's this wisdom that says that uh, when you do a migration. Even though if you're just moving stuff and you're going to redirect sites and things like that, um, you know you you could potentially schedule a maintenance window and say, "Hey, everyone, just so you know, this content's going to be migrated between this time and this time," and you socialize that a long time in advance so they know, and uh, you make sure that they're not impacted by it. So again, because if you're going to be uh, migrating the finance folks uh, just before fiscal year end, that's not good. Right, so normally they would say schedule a maintenance window and make sure that people are aware of it. I tell, I'm telling you that that's what lunches are for, right? So most people go for lunch at some point, right? So reboot the servers during lunch. Uh, yes, that's a lettuce sandwich on a paper bag. Uh, that is, well, that's my picture of lunch, right? Um, I'm just kidding. I go out for super expensive lunches for two hours. But anyways, um, you know, when you're doing your, you're rebooting a server, do that while people are having lunch. Um, you know, because everybody goes to lunch at the same time, don't they? And I mean, of course, there's always the people across the different time zones that might be affected, but whatever. You pick one time zone that's most convenient to you and you reboot the server during that time, right? Um, so good thing we're not doing any scheduling maintenance windows or anything like that, right? Some people will ask you to migrate your, your or to schedule a migration so they're predictable, but again, they're gonna start demanding maintenance windows and they'll start demanding that you've prepared the steps in advance to, uh, of course I build clients for my lunch, by the way, Chris Kent. Um, so you don't wanna do that, right? Um, all right, so, and then the finance people, again, I keep on going back to them because they always they always have their special needs that they have these things that you know ooh we're keeping the company afloat and we're you know we're paying checks and everything um, so just keep them in the dark that's my recommendation hopefully my presentation is evil enough for you today I'll continue I've got a few more slides for you uh, one of the things that I always like to tell you is the uh, training is for babies. Right. When you migrate to Microsoft 365, you're asking your users to learn a whole new set of tools and a whole new way of working, right? Working in the cloud and not having to VPN. And then they're going to cry and they're going to be like, we, we, we need training, right? And experts will tell you that preparing your users in advance with some communication and training will help uh, them kind of prepare and remove that fear of the unknown. Um, but from my perspective, Training the users make them soft and it prepares them for too much, right? I much prefer to be paid to fix issues after the migration is completed because users are doing completely the wrong thing. My favorite is when you migrate stuff to a whole new platform and then you got that one person 
that keeps on saving to the old file share where they used to save stuff. And that file that they're working on, right, is the one thing that that is the most important for all the other processes. I love when I find these things like that. Now, again, there's all sorts of ideas out there, like people saying, you know, uh, migrate a site and then mark, mark the site as read-only, the, the original site is read-only, or the file share is read-only, put a shortcut so that people know where the file is, because maybe they have short, they have themselves a shortcut and uh, or bookmarks or things like that. So help them, right? Not just, not just with training, but also uh, predicting that they're going to do the wrong thing. Uh, but again, my favorite thing is let them fail, let them freak out, or let them not realize that they're failing, which is even better because then you get paid to go back and fix issues and um, you know recover things. Uh, and then one-time training, if you have to do training, I guess one-time training, you know, will do. Like train everyone at the same time, regardless of what business unit they're from. Uh, train them all together at one time and then just don't give them a chance to retrain again or miss the training uh, and, and throw technology to people. Um, that's, I mean, that's how you teach people how to swim, right? Uh, so throw, uh, throw technology at people and let them figure it out. By the way, governance is more trouble than it's worth. I once used to work with probably one of my heroes. Uh, she was a, CTO for a large company, and she used to say that governance is for when you get in trouble, right? When you run in trouble, and this is a true story, when you run in trouble, that's when you start worrying about governance. Other than that, governance is more trouble than it's worth. And I agree with that. Uh, again, a lot of people will tell you, oh, governance is important, and you know, uh, you need to look at all sorts of aspects of governance. Like, the, you know, it's not just one approach to governance. There's there's content uh, governance, there's, uh, you know, development lifecycle governance, there's all sorts of governance that comes into play here. Who's allowed to create apps? Who's allowed to create power apps? Who's allowed to create sites and things like that? Um, that's more trouble than it's worth, really. Don't think about it until, until you run into trouble and then come up with an excuse on the fly. <laughs> and remember, that users are stupid, right? Uh, and you should treat them as such, right? Stupid when you start talking to them. Uh, don't teach them the new features uh, or new ways to do things they don't, because they won't understand, right? Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, you know, if you give them too many choices, people are, are just going to be confused. Um, you know, oh, I have Teams and I have OneDrive and I have SharePoint. It's too confusing, right? So don't teach them new features. In fact, disable all the features that people never experienced before, like things like Teams and OneDrive and Planner, and turn that stuff off uh, because they're too stupid to handle new things. Sure, like maybe there's one or two groups that might need these features and might be able to, to learn to use them. But that's too much of a risk to take, right? It's better to treat everyone like they're stupid. And by the way, champions are more troubles, trouble than they're worth. So champions are, again, uh, in all the boring migration blogs and articles that you've read out there, they talk about establishing champions. Like, so find people in your organization who are suffering. Right, they're they're dying. They have uh, they need to solve a problem, and your migration might just be the thing that would help them. And they're going to be willing to run into whatever issues you have uh, to find all sorts of bugs and things like that because they're suffering and they're willing to do this. And normally, what experts will tell you is find the loudest person out there, right? The most opinionated person that will affect that will influence everybody else, and make them your champions. Because if you can talk to them and if you can get them to buy into your migration and you get them to use your, uh, your tool, uh, they will do the work for you. They'll go out and they'll convince everyone else, right? Um, so don't, don't do the whole champion thing. It's, uh, it's actually even better if you can keep those loud people in the dark, surprise them. And now the cool thing about that is those loud people are all often the ones that are 
the quickest to make uh, an opinion and make up stories about how how bad this migration is going to be. And and they often have the ear of of the executives out there if they're not executives themselves. Uh, so, you know, by not identifying champions and by keeping everyone in the dark, you're letting them kind of introduce trouble in your migration. And it's awesome. And I'm trying to follow up the chat here. And I'm, I must admit I've lost I've lost you here. Um, so speaking of champions, there's something called dog fooding, right? Eating your own dog food, I think, is the expression. So this comes from a, an old ad, I think it was an Alpo ad, where the president of Alpo, to demonstrate the good quality of the dog food, uh, the president would actually eat the dog food himself. And then, of course, he would he would say, if it's good enough for me, it's good for, for my dog. Um, in IT, and especially I think Microsoft is, is famous for, for using the expression of dog fooding. In IT, we're referring to dog fooding as using the tool that you're building to deliver the tool. All right. So, for example, if you're doing a migration to uh, Microsoft 365 and you do, you're doing a migration to, um, you know, to show people how to use things like Teams and SharePoint, uh, Dog fooding would mean use Teams, use a SharePoint site, right? Use the features of SharePoint to actually tell people how it works. Like talk, start with your champions, get them involved, and then show them, see how cool this is, right? And see how, you know, let's not go and manage an Excel spreadsheet in a file share somewhere. Uh, let's actually put it in a SharePoint site and let's collaborate on that. Even better, right? In Teams, you have uh, something called Whiteboard. You can actually do a really cool whiteboard where you're planning your whole, you can do mind mapping sessions and brainstorming sessions and planning sessions, and it's interactive and it's visual and you can zoom in and zoom out. Uh, that's really cool. And I can tell you that when you start getting people to, to use the tool that you're migrating them to, to do the migration, they're going to be sold. They're going to be in love with it. And they're going to, they, they won't, like they won't be able to wait, right? They'll want to use your tool and they'll want to migrate and they'll want to tell everybody else how cool it is. And, you know, and again, this is all a bad thing, but the other thing they'll do is they'll actually go and, and tell everybody else how awesome your new migration is and your new tool is. And everyone's going to expect, everyone's going to be like, ah, not fair. I want that too. Please migrate me. So don't dog food stuff because again, you're setting a precedent. Keep them in the dark as much as possible. And speaking of Teams, Teams is just a fad. So Teams is just one of those things that, you know, it's just it's just a client that allows people to do all the collaboration in one place, right? I mean, really, from my perspective, Teams is just a fancy chat window, right? But uh, a lot of people think otherwise. They think that Teams is really the, the modern way of collaborating and that more and more you'll be able to access all tools in one place uh, and give users kind of that, that one awesome experience that they, they can fall in love. And it's a mobile experience and it's a it's a you know it's it's a remote experience as well. And uh, that's great, but that's just a fad. So don't fall for it. Uh, avoid teams as long as you can. Um, don't let people teamsify projects or or sites or anything like that. Uh, block it if you can, really. Um, yes, so let's talk about some bonus wisdom here. And I left some. Uh, yeah, Jamie, uh, I'm uh, I'm sorry, you probably joined the wrong presentation. Um, this was supposed to be how to succeed uh, migration. However, uh, I'm uh, Hugo's evil uh, twin brother, and I'm actually taking over the presentation. I'm teaching people how to fail migrations. Thank you. So bonus wisdom. Um, you know, so we have a few more minutes. Let's go through this. So the first thing and my favorite thing as a consultant, as a way to uh, to charge your customers more money is rebrand SharePoint completely. Like if it still looks like SharePoint, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you want to make sure, first of all, most importantly, right? You want to go into your SharePoint site and you want to make sure that the company logo occupies like the most area possible on top of the page, right? Because people might forget who they work for, right? So 
like slap a giant logo right there at the top of the screen so that people have to scroll to see relevant content. Um, and then, you know, the cool thing about this is that Microsoft, if you go in and you completely change the CSS and the HTML and you inject some JavaScript and, and basically do things that Microsoft says is not supported, uh, you can actually go in and you can break SharePoint in a way that, because the, the SharePoint team can actually release new features every week. That means that if you're playing it, your, your cards right, your clients might call you every week before they need you to go fix their custom branding, right? And and this is one where I don't think you'll have to fight with your clients because a lot of clients will always be like, oh, it must have our corporate colors, you know, or or uh, and forget things like accessibility and things like that, right? Or our corporate colors are uh, yellow and slightly lighter yellow, right, on white background. Uh, so I know it's a low contrast thing for accessible people, but it's our corporate brand, so we must keep to these colors and uh, you know ignore all the research that Microsoft has done in terms of contrast analysis and accessibility and things like that and legibility. Use your custom fonts, use your custom colors, and rebrand SharePoint completely. And speaking of rebranding, uh, you know the other thing that you can do is waste valuable time trying to rename SharePoint.com, right? Um, because remember, users are stupid. If if your site is called contoso.sharepoint.com and they work for the company called Contoso, they won't understand what that means. They won't understand that, well, what do you mean? It says sharepoint.com. It doesn't say contoso.com. I'm all confused, right? So I highly encourage you to waste precious time and your client's expense, of course, uh, to find ways to rename um, it to something like sharepoint.contoso.com. Now, there's a rumor out there that Microsoft will soon allow you to uh, create vanity URLs. Um, so you'd be able to, let's say you made a mistake when you created your tenant. And uh, now that's the URL you're stuck with. Now you're called, you know, Contoso Inc. SharePoint.com. There is a rumor that Microsoft in some future will actually allow you to rename uh, your site and your tenant. Uh, but... Uh, no, it's actually real. It's this is a real thing. I'm not being sarcastic. I mean, have I been sarcastic the whole time? Uh, no, it's a real thing. There is a rumor that it's going to be happening. Uh, however, don't tell your customers that because if it's just going to be a feature that you're going to be able to rename uh, tenants, um, you know, you don't get to bill your clients for that. And then we've talked a little bit about this, but you want to disable all the features you don't understand. Right. Again, I don't need to talk about this too much, but like if you don't understand what Power Apps does or Power Automate or, you know, to do, disable it. Right. Because if you can't understand it, your users can't understand. And especially because if you do, you might have to get involved with some kind of um, uh, governance process. All right. Last few things, right? So uh, my probably my favorite thing is uh, in terms of evil things to do, force every single person to go to your homepage, no expression, no no exception whatsoever, right? Um, and experts will tell you that if you design SharePoint to meet the user's needs, they'll automatic it'll automatically become the first place where they go every day. And if you use Teams, it'll automatically be that one thing that people want to spend their day and and do their work. Uh, the best thing to do is force people for their browser to launch to your company's homepage every single time. Uh, and that way, because that's the only way they'll get your company news, right? And that's the only way they'll see your company information. Now, experts will tell you that there's such a thing as banner blindness, and people will instantly turn off their brain and not pay attention when you show them that stuff. But what do they know, really, right? Yeah, redirects for the win. So I'm just going to skip this one. I want to do, thank everybody for listening to me. Obviously, there's a lot more, uh, you know, evil wisdom that I have to share with you, but that's all the time I have. If you have any questions, I'm going to stick around here um, for questions. And uh, Hugo can be reached at Bernier H on Twitter, and you can read the, the, my his blog. At his, this is hard, harder than it seems. Uh, you can reach Hugo Bernier at Tahoe Ninjas blog. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. I'm sticking around for questions.
Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> let's go. Let's go run some migrations. Yeah, you're right, Mohammed. Thank you. And thank you, Susan. And for the record, this uh, this presentation um, came from watching an actual my live migration that was done by a partner that I had I was asked to come in and clean up after they had done their migration. Uh, so I pretty much just documented all the things that he had said. Uh, this is no joke. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.